I think there's two sides to it. One is, is, is the notion that Schreber, in many ways, has all the passion and scale of, of a religious visionary, and yet most of us probably wouldn't really call what he describes a religion. Yet also, one of the things about outsider art, be it visual art or literature like Schreber, is that we as a wider community tend to be very fascinated by that work and I think the reason for that is that there are deep archetypal structures in these visions that really resonate with the rest of us. So when Schreber tells us that he sees the secrets of the universe, uh, we may deem him insane but we half believe him too and that's important because that questions who we are and where our beliefs stand and also creates a more humane space for someone like Schreber. Gives in a way, gives him the respect that he's due. Mm -hmm. In another age, he could have been a holy man. Mm -hmm. In the late 19th century, he was in an asylum. Mm -hmm. These things are context sensitive. Daniel Paul Schreber was uh, an, a really, really successful judge in the late 19th century. Um, in a way probably the most brilliant lawyer of his generation and then when he was about 50 he became really severely psychotic um, and started to receive messages from God and the two big elements in, his, in, in these messages were he felt he was controlled by a cosmic writing down machine that dictated to him all his thoughts and he believed he was going to be changed into a woman, and that, that was a kind of a sacrifice that he would make to save the world. So he was in various quite punitive mental hospitals for about 10 years, and in that time he wrote an autobiography uh, and used that book to make a legal plea that... Um, that his beliefs were in effect his private religious beliefs and that they did not affect his competence in other areas and that he should be deemed sane even though he held beliefs um, and behaved in ways that were generally considered insane. And he won the case, which I found incredibly <coughs> interesting. And there's another layer to his story, which is that uh, his father was a famous child educationalist and wrote these best-selling books about how to bring up and discipline children in which he designed all kinds of machines for controlling children. And it seems to be pretty undoubted that Schreber was subjected to those machines as a child. And there's a close correlation between the structures of those machines and some of the structures of his delusions. So there's a lot of layers to the story, mm -hmm. basically. One of the early problems in the film was how to visualise the writing machine. And I started working very early on with the uh, visual effects supervisor, Baron Onlevier, and we started basically building a fictional writing down machine. It's based on a typewriter called the Malling Hansen typewriter, which was uh, one of these unsuccessful inventions that in, its, in a way was brilliant. And it was a half, a very beautiful dome, a half sphere with the keys all sticking out. Um, and we basically took that unit and I, I wanted to, I basically mirrored it because I wanted it to be able to fly and it became like a satellite. Uh, and then we looked to split it and fill it with organic, almost sort of sexual contents and put it back together again. So this typewriter became the basic unit of our writing down machine. Um, and you see a whole cosmos of them. You see sort of, uh, uh, shots in which there's a whole galaxy of these writing machines. Well, the project has these two parts, which is the film, Shockhead Soul, and then the exhibition, uh, the it's a moving image installation, the Sputnik effect. And they're really um, kind of partner pieces um, in kind of conversation with each other. And what they have in common is this fictional writing down machine. The installation is updated to the 50s and the, the aspect of it being more like a satellite um, is what we explore, if you like, in the installation. The, the Sputnik effect is something psychiatrists talk about, which is when Sputnik went up in the 50s, people stopped arriving at psychiatric casualty saying that they were being persecuted by God, even if it was machines persecuting them. Previously, it tended to be God 
motivating that. And they started just arriving, talking about human technology persecuting them. So people started to arrive and say Sputnik was spying on them or Sputnik was sending them messages. And I was interested in this, this shift of taking a fictional writing machine and sh- shifting it across period. Um, the film has a lot of interviews with psychiatrists and psychoanalysts, and one of the things that people came back to is that that kind of psychotic delusion uh, is very related to cutting-edge technology. So an example that someone gave was nowadays Schraver might say that al-Qaeda was hacking into their, their Twitter account. In other words, it, these delusions update with really, really the most cutting-edge technology that carries the most anxieties in a way. Um, and we're, so we're trying to in, evoke that 1950s paranoia and, and the installations in 3D uh, using the classics sort of red-green glasses like, like all those monster from the Black Lagoon movies because we wanted that classic pulp science fiction association, if you like. In the way that the project crosses between visual arts and film is, is something that I, you know, I, I believe in rather passionately and I would like to pursue more. And um, when I first made short films in, in, in London, they were often, in a way, rather classic experimental films or experimental animation. But they were also funded by Channel 4 and shown on television, so they sat in a hybrid space where they would have a wider audience than maybe a film like that would normally have. And one of the things as a, in the two feature films I've made that I've been interested in is taking strategies that would normally be experimental film strategies and bringing them into this more slightly more commercial space. I mean, these are small commercial films, but nonetheless they get distributed through that kind of, in that space. And so I see um, making art, making a moving installation, which is in an art gallery, um, as an extension of that blurring and crossbreeding of those lines. And essentially, I'm very interested in the frayed edges of those areas. And I think there's a huge amount to be gained from there being more of a continuity between classic art spaces and classic film spaces. It makes no sense that they seem so unable to sort of speak to each other. I think my movies are my my real voice. That's in a way why I make the films, because um, otherwise my real self wouldn't have a voice. En dat, dat moest die bal zijn. Dat is een soort ja, fictieve typemachine die, die de hoofdpersoon in zijn uh, film ziet. Maar er moest er ook een op het bureau staan. Uh, het was een 3D-model en daar hebben ze een plot van gemaakt. Een 3D-plot. En dan, dat komt dan helemaal wit uit die machine. En vervolgens heb ik, uh, dat was dan mijn aandeel, uh, uh, ik heb die, die bal zeg maar, beschilderd. En, uh, het helemaal geëetst. Dus Je hebt hem, laat zeggen, materieel naar deze wereld gehaald. Precies, precies. Het was, het was gewoon wit. En uh, ja, ik heb dat een beetje dat, die, dat oude, de patina van de tijd gegeven. Zodat het overeenkwam met uh, de film. Ja, en en deze, de, deze prop zeg maar, staat dan op een gegeven ogenblik op een bureau. En uh, uh, dan zie je de hoofdpersoon zitten. En verder zie je weer... 3D-animaties van hetzelfde object, maar dan helemaal in 3D en geanimeerd en zo. Ja. 